Now in fall 1939, the Wehrmacht defeated the Polish forces rather quickly. Now some might argue that Poland was not a real enemy and also that due to the Soviet Union attacking Poland from the east as well, it was not a fair fight. Yet we should not forget to look at the context and namely the last war war, the first world war. As Citino points out, perhaps Poland was not a true test of the new mechanized German army. It was a second rate power without modern weaponry. But even countries like Poland had proved to be tough nuts to crack in World War I. Belgium, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria. Yet what is far more interesting is the fact that the German Army High Command was not happy with the German performance at all in the Polish campaign. In every sense this campaign was an outstanding operational success. Yet the Oberkommando des Heeres, the German Army High Command, judged the operational success as insufficient and inadequate. Now the question is why was the German Army High Command not happy about the performance of the German troops? Now the first factor is culture and the German Army High Command was very self-critical and honest at this point. Quite often one problem is that people tend to confirmation bias, where they look at evidence to confirm their previous views. In this case it was different. What must be emphasized is that the German army in its lessons learned analysis of the Polish campaign did not use its studies to support existing doctrine, rather it used its after action report to improve doctrine and military standards throughout the army. Now it is rather obvious that the German army throughout the war had various shortcomings, especially in the strategy department, yet at the same time the German army was fighting a large amount of enemies until the bitter end and quite often successfully on the tactical and operational level. Murray attributes this to the self-critical nature. This willingness to be self-critical was one of the major factors that enabled the German army to perform at such a high level throughout World War II. And I think this is clearly related to a video I did a few years ago where I addressed that some people pointed out that I am so negative about the Wehrmacht. In this video I explained that it comes down to culture. The short version is, in Germany and Austria even nowadays education is mostly done with the stick not the carrot. Whereas in other countries there seems to be more of a carrot approach. Quite interestingly, Murray noted a very similar observation, although for different times and organizations. In fact, the after actual reports, Erfahrungsberichte of the German army for the whole period 1938 to 1940 reflected a very different tone than the author's experience in the US Air Force in the 1960s. In the later case, reports on the combat capabilities and performance consistently became more and more optimistic the higher the headquarters. The opposite was the case with the German after action reports. The higher the headquarters, the more demanding and dissatisfied were commanders with operational performance. Second of course, there were some major problems as well in the German army during the campaign. The German troops had to for the most part not receive proper training in providing security nor reconnaissance. Another problem was during the attacks that the discipline of the infantry was lacking as was the cooperation between the different branches, especially heavy weapons and artillery support. Another issue was that when switching to the defensive, the infantry often deployed into linear formation instead of a defense in depth. Another issue was that due to the air superiority, the German troops became careless about camouflaging. Other issues with infantry forces were, German infantry had not come up to the expectations in either night fighting or in combat in heavy terrain. Troops had a tendency to halt and fire when they ran into enemy units and thus to force the enemy to the ground. Attacks were often not pushed home. When it came to the panzer forces, a lack of cooperation between panzer and infantry forces was noted. Something that basically plagued every army at least once during the Second World War. For instance, US forces had severe problems with this during the Normandy campaign, as pointed out in this video. Third is more of an aspect on how and less on why. Now in order for the high command to be concerned with the performance, it needed information it could be critical about. And this required a certain openness within the organization. Whereas many authors point out that the Red Army was basically paralyzed during and after the Great Purges due to a climate of fear, this was quite opposite in the German Army. There appears to have been little fears on the part of German commanders that critical comments and evaluations of the unit's performance would be unwelcomed by superiors. Quite on the contrary, in addition, the high command expected commanders to give negative evaluations of the units if there were weaknesses. Note that some of this behavior likely changed over the course of the war. 
Now to the fourth aspect, which was that the Germans were far more concerned about their arch enemy, the French. And unlikely many people nowadays, the Germans back then respected the French tremendously and considered them their main enemy. As such, they were quite dismissive about most successes in Poland, for instance. Light divisions established in 1935 as a sop to the cavalry had performed adequately in Poland, but German reports stressed the conditions in Poland against a weak and disorganized opponent might well not be repeated in the West. Friese points out that the German generals were actually quite pessimistic and that the French actually shared their view. Likewise, the assessment of Lieutenant General von Sodenstern, chief of the general staff of Army Group A, is characteristic of the pessimism prevailing within the generality. Despite all the appreciation of the successful employment of tanks in Poland, it must be said that little or no prospect of success can be ascribed to it in the face of such a defense in the West. Interestingly, the general staff of the Western powers arrived at the same result. Thus, the French Prime Minister Renault described the German attack on Poland merely as an expedition. And we all know how that turned out. And this is also related to the last point, namely that the Germans were rather aware that they lost the last war, which we call now the First World War. As such, they looked at learning from this conflict as well and not repeating past mistakes. One key example was this. In October 1939, the commander-in-chief of the army established a monthly evaluation report for divisional and corps commanders to indicate the level of combat effectiveness of their units. So as to avoid the mistakes of the German high command in World War I, in overestimating the fighting ability and capabilities of frontline units. Now one video where I put this information to good use is in my Road to Stalingrad video, where we take a look at the stark difference in combat readiness ratings in 1931 versus 1942 of German divisions on the Eastern Front. As you can see, the German army went from an army that had a majority of its divisions suited for all operations to an army that was mainly suited for defensive operations according to their own assessment. Of course, several divisions could be reinforced till summer 1942, but still the difference is staggering. Now the question arises, how could the German army with these numbers still achieve the initial successes of Case Blue? But you probably have a question on your mind, namely of course, what did the Germans do? Well, first off, the German army high command initiated a major retraining program. Already on October 13th, so only one week after the campaign in Poland was concluded, the German Army High Command released their memorandum on the training of the field army, which pointed out the exclusive goal of each training exercise is the insertion of troops in battle. Besides weapons and battle training, the education of the soldiers stands in the foreground. Troops are to be hunted and prepared to meet the highest demand of war, especially against an enemy trained and equipped with modern weapons. Within German divisions, the training was done from the bottom up. So first the individual soldier, then the squad, followed by the platoon and then the company training. Additionally, men that were not considered suited were removed and replaced with new draftees. Training aimed at bringing the troops and leadership to the physical and mental breaking point. And above all, the training aimed to inoculate an offensive spirit into German troops preparing for the coming push in the West. Yet besides merely training their troops, the Germans did even more. They made sure that they did train their trainers, to use a modern phrase. Moreover, the Oberkommando des Heeres took control of scheduling officers and NCOs to attend training schools. Most of the staff from the infantry training school at Doberitz were transferred to active units on the Western Front, while the Oberkommando des Heeres brought in officers and NCOs who had had combat experience either in the West or in Poland. As such, they made sure that there was a constant flow of knowledge and experience from and to the front. To conclude, after the successful campaign in Poland, the German Army High Command was quite critical of the various shortcomings within the army, despite the victory. This was due to their focus on the upcoming campaign against France, the overall culture of being critical and admitting weaknesses. Furthermore, they did not want to repeat the errors of the First World War, where at times the leadership had lost touch with the combat capabilities of their troops. If you liked this video, consider supporting me either by sharing or supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.